Uh, welcome, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, happy September. Welcome to the August uh, virtual meetup uh, for the Kansas City Tug. Um, we are excited to uh, be presenting today uh, to you all. So this, as you saw in the uh, in the invite and on the uh, on the event page, we kind of took this theme as um, from the survey that we have everyone fill out uh, to talk about different ideas for different uh, different topics to hear uh, about. We saw that uh, there were quite a few people who were interested in the in the data prep side of of how to do Tableau. So uh, we met uh, earlier this earlier uh, back in August and we kind of put together this uh, idea for a presentation or a tug. What could what would happen uh, if we could just have a a tug that was all about data prep and data structure and how to get your data ready for analysis in Tableau. So I know we spend a lot of time uh, on the on the viz side uh, of of Tableau, but uh, today we're going to take that uh, one step for before that. What happens before you get to Tableau? So really excited for today. We've got three awesome speakers. Um, and uh, we're, we're ready to get this uh, kicked off. So before we do that, uh, a couple of uh, announcements on housekeeping. First off, if you've never been on a, a virtual tug meeting, um, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> there are two options for communicating um, during this uh, virtual tug. We have the Q&A feature. Uh, the Q&A is going to be for the speaker, for the presenter. Um, that's where you can ask your questions. You can answer that. You can ask them at any time um, for any speaker, um, whatever you need. Uh, we'll have people monitoring those uh, as we go along. Uh, the next thing is going to be the chat feature. So the chat feature is what it sounds like. It's a way for you all to chat uh, amongst yourselves, amongst each other, uh, with us. Um, just make sure that when you do that, uh, you check the option for all panelists and attendees, uh, because right, I think it's defaulted to all panelists. That will only go to the people on the sidebar right now. Um, but if you do all panelists and all attendees, that will go to everybody. So uh, shout out, say hi to everybody you know. Um, and uh, if you see anything cool um, during these presentations, be sure to put that in the chat uh, because um, we love we we love that. So um, other announcements um, going on. Oop. Let's see. There we go. All right. So the big announcement that came out today uh, is Data Twenty uh, Tableau Conference ish uh, is happening virtually, uh, and it's free for all. So if you've always wanted to come to conference uh, but have never been able to, this is your year. Thanks, COVID. Um, and uh, it's going to be a, obviously it's going to be different. It's not going to, it's, we're kind of reimagining the way that conferences can be, uh, but it is going to be October 6th through the 8th for everyone in the U.S. Um, and it's going to be all day uh, and all night. So if you wake up at 2 a.m. with a Tableau question and you can't figure out the answer, there will be something happening uh during uh during the conference during those three days so check out that link up at the top uh get registered and uh we can't wait to uh we can't wait for it it's going to be uh it's going to be fun it always is all right so let's get into our content first up uh we've got aaron um who's going to talk about how to structure data for analysis in tableau take it away aaron sounds good thank you sean I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's share the screen here. Maybe, there we go. And verify that I'm not crazy and that you can actually see this. Sean, can you see my screen? You're good to go. All right. Hello, Kansas City. It's great to see you. 
us virtually. Right now you're a tiny green dot on my screen, but I'm trusting you that you're there. Thank you all so much for showing up. We've had a fun time um, putting together a, a, a tug for you guys. It's all about all of the work we never talk about, but spend all of our time doing, which is making the data ready for analysis in Tableau. So I thought I would um, kind of give a little preface today about something called tidy data, which is um, a, a term that I will fully explain comes from Hadley Wickham, and um, I think it's I think it's pretty helpful. So um, this talk is especially for those of you who come from the BI side of things. So you are business intelligence, you're business analyst, you know the content of your data super well, but you maybe don't have a background in um, in data structures. You don't know what a relational database looks like under the hood. You haven't messed around too much in Tableau prep. Maybe you are new to Tableau and to kind of visual analytics to begin with. And you may know exactly what the data means when you see it, which is why you definitely should be the ones analyzing the data, but you may not know how it works behind the scenes. And um, this is a this is very relatable for me personally because this is where I came from. So once upon a time, here's how my uh, Tableau fairy tale started out because I feel like you go to the Tableau conference and everyone's like, I had all of these horrible experiences in Excel and then I found Tableau and everything lived happily ever after. And it's kind of like that, but not necessarily. So here's what happened, happened for me. Uh, I went to a captivating demo where Tableau came to campus. I was working at a university at the time. It was at the end of the afternoon on a Friday and I just really wanted to get out of the office. Didn't know what Tableau was, thought I'd go check it out. Uh, didn't someone from our office need to go take notes? Yes, I was told and I got to leave. Went to the demo, thought it was fascinating, came back to the office and said, okay, the dean who I was working for at the time, can you please, please, please buy me a license? And he said, I'll do you one better. I'll buy a license and I'll send you to training as well. And I thought this is the coolest thing ever. Went to a week long training left utterly inspired, had an entire notebook of, of ideas, dashboards, sketches, things that I thought I could bring back to our office to just make everything sing and dance. I was working in the graduate school, which meant we had PhD student data that we were working with and trying to help those folks through, you know, a six year process to get their PhD. Had a million ideas of what I could build in Tableau with all of our data that I, again, knew really well, knew what the data meant, especially one student at a time, but it never worked with it, how it was actually structured behind the scenes, which meant that I got back to the office and everything went uh, into a screeching halt um, because I had no clue how the data was structured. And I think this is super common. In fact, many analysts who end up with a Tableau license may be the perfect people to analyze the data because they know exactly what the data means and have no clue how data is structured behind the scenes. Now, if you're sitting there and you're going, I know how data is structured behind the scenes. I'm a, I'm a SQL wizard, I'm a database wizard, I run our, you know, our, our data warehouse. This talk then for you is about empathizing with the folks on the other side of the office who maybe don't have those skill sets and yet have wonderful ideas of what they could build in Tableau. And the really hard part is that Tableau training, when you send an analyst to it, rarely includes any data structure knowledge. So if you don't come to the table with that already, you're not necessarily gonna get it when you go to a beginning or intermediate or even full week training like I went to originally. In fact, the person who finally explained to me how the data was gonna be structured actually turned out to be my husband of all people. He's a programmer, he's been super nerdy in the tech world long before I was. And I came home one day so frustrated with, I have all these ideas and I can see the cells in my CSV that I wanna work with. And when I attach it to Tableau, I just can't build what I'm envisioning. And so, um, you know, like a good therapist, he was like, okay, draw it out. What's the problem? Explain yourself. And I took a sketch and I showed him how our data was currently structured. And he said, stop right there. I bet you a million dollars behind the scenes, the data is actually structured like this. And I said, oh my gosh, if that were true, all my problems would be solved. Here's the data structure I had. So I was working with fall uh, and spring funding data for students. So I come in, maybe the first student's teaching, uh, doing a teaching assistantship for a semester. They get paid for that. Following spring, they're doing the same work. They get paid for that too. Maybe you're just starting at the university and you get a fellowship for your first year. You have your funding for the fall, your funding type, and your funding for the spring. Now, if you are sitting here going, I know exactly how this should be structured. This talk, again, empathy. There are people in your office who cannot see what you currently can see so clearly on the screen. 
The structure that I needed but had no clue how to ask for looks like this. It's what we call long and skinny data all the time. We've got our student IDs, gets repetitive, and every transaction, i.e. every student's individual semester, gets a row. So we've got the semester, 2014. In our little world, the 05 is fall, 02 is spring. So these would sort properly. We had our student, we've got the semester, what their funding is, what their funding amount is. And suddenly when I would put this into, tab to, into Tableau, it would sing and dance. Suddenly I could build everything that I was looking for. The problem is that the first version that you saw was actually exactly what we had asked for. We had actually requested our data to come through like that. The reason being, at the time, before Tableau came along, we were actually using Excel to just tidy it up and send it back to the departments to let their, them know how their students would be funded. And what that meant was not only was had this been, you know, and I can only imagine what the SQL query behind the suite scenes looked like to get that data in the way we had requested it, but the other thing was, is as an analyst who had just received a big investment from the boss, right? Here's a Tableau license, here's a week of training. This was the only way, this little export button that someone in IT had created for us was the only way that I knew how to access the data. So what I thought I would tell you is that even though initially see the demo, get the purchase, go to training, so many ideas, screeching halt, that went really fast. By the time I actually had made my first dashboard that was anywhere you, close to useful, six months had passed. And so my goal today is to share, if you are someone who is, you've got your Tableau license, you've got lots of ideas, you know the data really well, but you don't necessarily know how the data should be structured and you're running into issues, is to cover some of the foundations, some of the concepts that I wish someone had told me <laughs> here at the beginning of the screeching halt, before six months of had passed before the first dashboard actually came in. So I'm gonna share with you quick things about what tidy data actually means. I'm gonna share three of the common culprits, the three most common data structure problems we see, what the problem is, the telltale sign in Tableau, how it starts acting up when it, we're, you know, it doesn't have the data the way it expects, and what the solution is. And we'll do a quick Tableau demo to show you what some of those things actually look like when you're loading them into desktop answer any questions, and then from there, we'll pass it off to Carl. So let's talk about tidy data. I love this quote. This is actually an essay that comes from a humanist, Lisa Gittleman. She says, raw data is an oxymoron. Raw data is an oxymoron. Data is a human invention, and you can get into some really fascinating discoveries, whether mathematics itself is something that we observe in our world or something that we create. But data, when we start taking our observations and actually structuring it into cells and columns and rows, that's a human creation. It's just as fallible as any other type of information that we use as a way to know in the world. And because we've made it, it tends to be messy. Now, big picture, before we get into the structure side of things, I wanna emphasize kind of as a preface, there are two ways in which data can be messy. One of them is that the content can be messy, meaning what's literally written inside the cells, what's inside the cells that can be messy, and then the structure can be messy, how those cells are laid out. You can kind of think of them kind of like Legos, like what's inside the Lego, and then how you actually piece those Legos together. And when we talk about content, that's not really what we're talking about today. When I say you know, content, what's written inside the cells, when that is messy, our goal is that we want to be able to clean that up so we can compare and aggregate that data. And content inside a cell and in our data sets gets messy all the time because we're inconsistent humans. You can spell St. Louis a thousand different ways. We make errors all the time. We don't necessarily have all the data. Sometimes it's partial or it's empty. Um, the world is amb ambiguous, which means that sometimes our methodology is inconsistent. And then fundamentally, even if we sort out our methodology, Sometimes things change, but can, which can be hard too. So we're gonna set aside the content piece of this. There's lots of ways the data can be messy. There's lots of ways we can clean that up on the content side. What I'm talking about today is the structure. So I literally mean the individual cells, how, not what is inside these individual cells, but how we ordered them into columns and into rows. And our big goal here is that we want the computer, in this case, Tableau, to be able to actually see what we see. So we can glance at the, at the spreadsheet or the table in Oracle and we can see the data. 
what we want to be able to make sure is that Tableau can actually see it as well. So for those of you who uh, know me here in Kansas City, you know, I've got a weird poetry major background thing going on. So yep, I'm going to make sure we slip in one English quote here. Um, this comes from Hadley Wickham's uh, paper, Tidy Data, and he starts it by with a little, little epitaph saying, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And if you know what uh, book that comes from, put it in the chat. And Hadley Wickham says, like families, tidy data sets are all alike, but every messy data set is messy in its own way. So what do we mean by that? When you have a data structure that is messy, the path to tidying it up will often look very different. You might do that with SQL. You might do that with Tableau Prep. Carl's going to give us some great tips there. You might do some of it just in Tableau Desktop, which we'll do a demo here at the end of this. Um, and how you actually get your cells put together and into the rows and the columns that Tableau expects, that is going to look different. But the resulting structure, the structure of the data source that you ultimately connect Tableau to, that's going to look pretty much the same across the board with the caveat that unless you have some really, really strange circumstances. But if you are a new analyst on the BI side of things and you're connecting to Tableau and the structure's not working, usually it's that you don't have a tidy data set. So what do we mean by tidy data? So Hadley Wickham identifies three elements that make successful tabular data structures, which is what programs like R or Tableau expect. Um, and this is also just how relational databases tend to be set up. So first piece of the three part element here, one column per variable. That means that we have one column per dimension, per measure, per field, whatever our variables if are, are, we need one column per. And so if you make a list, and you know what your variables should be. You've got everything maybe from your you know, row ID to whatever you might have. Count it up. That's how many columns you should have. If you don't, you got a red flag. Then once we got our column structure set up, we've got one row per observation. Now this might be, these are our records, right? These are our rows. This could be one, um, you could think of these as like transactions. Scanning a credit card is a really good example. One event in our earlier you know, student example, it's one row per student's funding per semester. And then the last concept here is we are gonna have our columns, our rows set up one column per variable, one row per observation, and then one table per observation type. So making sure that our individual rows maintain a consistent granularity. So what does this look like? Imagine a table in Excel. We've got one column per variable. We've got student ID, we've got our semester, we've got our funding type, funding amount. And then every time we have an observation, one student per one semester, we add a row. Then we make sure that we have one table per observational unit, which means that if over here we're tracking a student's funding by semester, we probably keep their demographic information or their directory information in a separate table. Over here, observational unit is just one row per student. It could be their ID, their name, their department, whatever it might be. So let's talk about common culprits. Where do these things go wrong? I'm going to show you the three most common data structure problems that at least I've encountered with clients and definitely on my own as well and talk about what those data structure problems are, the telltale signs, how do we know that these are happening? How do we spot them? So what are their characteristics and how does Tableau react? And then what's our solution? Once we can say, yep, I'm pretty sure that this is the main problem that's happening, how do we fix that so that Tableau can actually read it? So first and foremost, data in the headers. So what does this mean? One of the most common problems that we see when we are going to attach Tableau to a data set, especially if it's in Excel. And when I say bring up Excel, it's because this common problem is most common when you're dealing with either sort of handmade or archival data, data sets that have been created for human eyes. Um, and so what happens is we actually have a piece of data in the headers instead of the variable names for those columns. So the most common culprit here is year. Um, and a good telltale, telltale sign is that your columns, the number of columns you have, does not equal the number of variables you have. So if you have you know, 15 years lined up, but you only have one variable there, which is year, your column, number of columns and number of variables, 
they don't line up. And when we put them in Tableau, you can see all the years for the line chart, but you can't actually make that chart. The solution to start is identify all your variables. What should your column headers look like? And often we can pivot the columns um, to become actually a one, one single column where we've got the header, and um, we'll do a demo of that in Tableau in just a little bit. Make a hypothesis. You should know how many, how many you know, rows and columns you think you should have after you pivot. Um, the number of columns will shrink. The number of rows will increase. And this is exactly the situation that I initially had that I, could, I couldn't recognize. I didn't understand why this was something. If you actually look at this table, we have five columns. We only have four variables, though. Our variables are the student ID, the semester, the funding type, and the funding amount. And so if we attach this to Tableau, we get something like this, where we've got you know, funding type, spring fund, fall funding type, spring funding type, fall funding amount, spring funding amount. We don't actually have that variable where we could filter by the different funding types or look at the total funding amount that has been allocated for the students. So what we need, we're gonna pivot the data, make sure we get one column per variable. All right, second common culprit. This is the opposite. <laughs> this is where we have overly pivoted data. This is much more common when you've got massive warehouses of data, you're asking for an enormous data dump from your SQL team maybe, um, and, or you're asking for an illogical combination of tables together. What we can, we look at it, we put it in Tableau, we usually have a variable called column name. So we'll have, or measures, something like that. And we put this in Tableau and we are either constantly filtering down to just narrow down to one variable, or we have to create calculated fields for every me measure or, or variable that we actually want to use. Solution is the reverse. This time we're gonna unpivot. You also hear people call this cast their variables into individual columns. And again, that, that sort of thing we're looking for, for goes back to you know, Hadley Wickham saying we should have one column per variable now we can use these independently. So you'll see something like this, where maybe you're looking at time to degree. How long does it take for students to finish their PhD? Maybe you've got your anthropology, uh, you know, um, average your minimum, you've got four years, your maximum, you've got 7.3 years. Art history, you've got minimum, three and a half years. Art history, max nine years. And what we'll actually do is if we put this little, these three columns into Tableau, the telltale sign is that we'll either be constantly filtering on the measure itself, which means we can only use minimum or maximum at any given time, or we will be making a calculated field every single time we're trying to use any of these variables, which means we'll have a calculated field where we say, if the measure equals minimum, then give me the value. That's our min time de degree, calculated field max time degree. If the measure equals the maximum, then give me the value. And what you can see is quickly, if you proliferate this with lots of different measures or lots of different columns that have been turned on their head, you're gonna end up with so many null values over here, you'll have a data set that's basically error. So I want to shrink this back up, give every column its own, uh, it, every variable its own column. The last one that we see all the time is, um, and I see this come out of databases, I see this come out of Excel archival data across the board, is rows with different granularities. So we got subtotals or grand totals or something else funky happening in along with our observational units or along with our rows. And the biggest telltale sign here is that when you sum up your variables, you pull out your data pill and says, all right, give me all the, you know, how, how much funding have we allocated for all the students? Suddenly we have something triple or quadruple or quintuple. There's a multiplication factor happening here. And there's often also implied data in the original data source that gets lost. So it's something that we can't use. So the solution, make sure you get those subtotals and grand totals out there unless you have a very good reason for keeping them in and you remember to filter them out all the time um, and make sure you add back in the implied information that may have been hiding in some of those subheaders. So for example, let's say you have something like this where you're looking at the number of students enrolled in a given department. We got art history, you got English, and then maybe you have a humanities discipline total. You got poli sci, you got psychology, and then maybe you have a social science discipline total. Well, this makes perfect sense to a human eye. If we go and tack this on in Tableau and sum up 
the students enrolled, we will get 500, which is too many, because it's going to add in all of the individual observational units as well as our subtotal disciplines. The other problem is, let's say we kick these out, then we don't necessarily know who's in the humanities or who's in the social sciences, and you would be surprised how contentious that distinction can be. So, what we want instead is to kick those out, but make sure implied information has been added in. In this case, we can just add a column for discipline so that we can easily filter it down to just the humanities or just the social sciences and still get our sum working properly. Okay, enough theory. Let's hop out of the slides. Let's look at a, a live example. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know, are, are people able to raise their hand? Maybe. Um, if you've ever had something, you know, in your own home um, or digitally, you can raise your hand. If you've ever been given a data set like this. Um, I love this. This is what you get when you download. Um, this is life expectancy data from the UN. And to be fair to them, they have a, another version that is the CSV that you'll see in just a second. But this is a fantastic example of where things can get pretty wonky pretty fast. So when you take a look at this, this is our life expectancy table, um, and not only, <laughs> there's a lot that is wrong here. We've got our big problem one and our big problem three. First one, data in the headers. We actually have our years, our half decades, going across the side like this, which is a problem. And we also have got a lot of additional information that is sitting in sub headers and totals that is not available actually in the data set. So if I go to connect this to Tableau, even if I'm savvy enough to go ahead and get rid of everything that's on the top so that my first row is indeed my, my headers and my, my variables, we're going to have a lot of issues. We're going to be in a situation where we can't actually use our timeline, which is the whole point of this longitudinal table. And we're also not going to be able to, if we look at some of these, these countries, we can see, again, human eyes glancing at the screen where things, where countries are being um, classified in the UN's taxonomy, but that information isn't available if we actually just strip out all the subtotals. We are going to end up with something that's cleaner, but we're still going to have some issues. So we're going to still have our decades going across the top, and we're not necessarily going to know who these folks are here. So let's go ahead and hop into Tableau and see how this works. We're going to have our life expectancy data from 1950 going half decades to 2020. Then we've got an almost identical table that is going to be same countries, but this time we are going to have the future expectations, what the predictions are from the UN. And then we're also going to have our little metadata table that's going to help us understand for those individual countries. Let's join these together. We've got our code here for the countries. We've got our country code here, so we know we can join these together and we'll be able to actually use all of the information that is in this original one, but a little tricky to actually navigate. So last but not least, let's hop into Tableau, see how this works. If we go to Excel and we will connect to our little data set here. We'll say open. And we will go ahead and grab just that first, uh, our, <laughs> come on Tableau, your, your people are watching. <laughs> we'll grab our first spreadsheet here. These are the values that we've seen before. And you can see that going along the top, this is again, data in the headers. What's our variable? Half decades. What's the problem here? We have our half decade items, the things you would expect to see inside of the variable happening at the top. And so if we go to our sheet, if I take out, first thing I always do, number of records to text, see if, I, if this makes sense. I've got one record per country. But what I actually want is for all of these to be a half decade or in this, you know, a year is the most common version of this, where I can actually use all of these. Because right now, if I try to bring this stuff out, I can't make even a line chart. I can't make a heat map. I can't make anything to line these up. So what I know right now I've got is if I look at my countries, I know I have one row per country. So the number of records equals the number of countries. Now make a hypothesis before we pivot this. If we have, and I'll help you cheat here, there's 15 or 14 half decades, what do we expect to happen? We expect to have 
um, our, our half decades pivot, and then we would expect to see one row per half decade per country. So now we would expect to see 201 times 14. So I'm gonna hop on over here to my data source. And here's how, if you've never pivoted in Tableau before, you've got a situation like this. We are going to select all of the headers that are actually just our half decade year, and we're gonna pivot them. And this data will become super long and skinny. We can rename this variable. These are our decade halves. And we've got our variable over here. This is our life expectancy. Go ahead and rename that. And make your hypothesis, okay? We're, we're thinking we've got 201 times 14. I have a cheat sheet because my mental math is not this good, but 2814 is what we're expecting, and that is what we actually get in here. Now, if you wanna take this to the next level, here's some, some fun additions. We remember that we have a identical sheet. So we just did this with the life expectancy, but we also have life expectancy prediction. So we should be able to do the exact same thing. We wanna be able to take this and pivot it so that we get these decade, future decades lined up with our previous decades. Now, how do we do that? We know that instead of joining, when we've got the same um, column headers, we're gonna union our tables. So when we're trying to add more columns to a data set, that's when we join. When we're trying to add more rows with the same column headers, that's when we union. So we've got our life expectancy predictions. We're gonna drag it to union. And we see the same problem uh, proliferate here, but we can highlight all of our decade halves and say add data to pivot. So when we do that as well, now we've got, think about your, your hypothesis here. So I'll help you cheat. There were 16 future half decades. So we've got 30 total decades we'd expect to see, 201 countries. My hypothesis then would be 6,030. And when I go look at my number of records, I have double that. So this is when we've got to figure out like, oh gosh, why is this happening? We've got our number of records here. Let's make a quick chart and see what we're seeing. We've got our countries here. We're gonna go ahead and take out our decade halves here. We can pull our life expectancy onto color. And here's the trick. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, well, this looks fine. Where are these extra records coming from? Because here I'm looking and I'm getting the number of marks that I would expect from the 201 countries times the 30, uh, the 30 um, decade halves. And so the way that we can figure this out is let's take a look at the table name or set this in front of it. And if we zoom out so that we can actually see all of this at the same, oh, not height, fit width, you'll see that we've actually duplicated this. We have all of our decades, decade halves, times both tables. So we know that we need to get rid of anywhere that there's not actually a life expectancy uh, value here. So if we look at this, we actually, for every single one of these tables, we ha now have two tables, it's got all the decade halves. But one of these tables has the first half and one of these has the second half, which means when we look at all of them together, we end up with a bunch of null values in between. If you are new to Tableau and this sort of data prep area, you may nev have never used the data source filter as well. So you can go ahead and click on that we can actually add a filter that will just keep a subset of the data that we might be bringing in here ahead of ever having to bring it in to um, any of our visualizations, which can save us time. So we've got our life expectancy here. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna go to special and I'm just gonna keep the non-null values. That is only keep the life expectancy records for the tables where we actually have something for that half decade. Say, okay. We'll pop back over to our number of records. Woohoo! The number of records goes to the right expectation. There's our hypothesis. This is one of the most fundamental pieces that I think I can share is that if you're new to trying to work with your data structure and figure out how it works, make a hypothesis of how many records, how many rows should you have, and then go test that and see if that's actually what you get. So last but not least, let's bring in our country codes. This, we want to add more columns, right? So instead of unioning the data where we want to add more rows, we want to add the additional columns that help us know the region, the subregion, the taxonomy, essentially, of the UN. And so we'll get our country code here. 
our country code here. And my hypothesis here is that every single country code in my life expectancy data should find a match from the taxonomy that the UN has also provided. So I'm gonna go with an inner join here and I think I should still have my 6,000 records, 6,030, and it decides to break. How about not country or area? How about M49 country code? Got to line these things up on things that actually match. So go to our number of records. You'll see it drops by 30 records and two country codes, which means we have lost two countries. It means that two countries that are sitting in our life expectancy data are not sitting in our UN uh, taxonomy because an inner join is only going to keep the records that find a buddy, find a match in each in each table. So if I take this to a left join and I say, okay, keep everything that we have in the life expectancy table and only bring in the additional ones that we find in our country codes in the UN taxonomy, let's see if we pop back. We do, we, we're back at our, our 6,030 records. So last hypothesis check here. Last hypothesis check is why are those different? So I'm gonna bring out my country code for both. I'm gonna flip these around. And you'll see I actually have two null values here. I have in the country or area that's coming from the UN taxonomy, there are two countries that are actually in the life expectancy data that do not find a match in the country or area. And it's funny, but this making that hypothesis and realizing you're two records short really matters. And I love this example to wrap up with because this is a politically charged join. We, in deciding whether we're going to do a left join or an inner join, are making a judgment call about whether Taiwan and the Channel Islands have their life expectancy data included in our analysis. And so the big thing that I, that I really want to emphasize here as we wrap up is just that as you're starting to work with data structures, if you are brand new to working with unions and joins, number of records, how many columns, how to manipulate your data structure so that it's ready for Tableau, it fits that tidy data. The biggest recommendation that I can make is the reason that you have a Tableau license is because you know the data as an analyst well. You're a content expert. And because you're a content expert, you can make really informed hypotheses about how many rows, how many folks, how many countries, whatever it might be on your data, you should find. And so jot those hypotheses down before you are working in Tableau so that you can check whether or not you're right. Or, or wrong. And then if something surprises you, like it does here, where I'm like, why are we, you know, potentially two countries short, then you can go investigate and make sure that your analysis actually is thorough as I know everyone wants theirs to be. So I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen there. And are there um, Q&A, right? Yes, I'm happy to send out the, the PowerPoint. And what version of Tableau are the pivot options available? A really long time, <laughs> um, I think. Um, I'm trying to think if there was, so I started using it in like 2013 or 14. So um, Carl, Sean, I don't know if you guys have answers, but the basic pivot options I think have been there um, for at least as long as I've been, been using it. Um, and yeah, what I would definitely, I would definitely say it goes back to the 9.0 versions at least. Awesome. Um, so I, I think it might be even earlier, but I, I actually did a sneaky Google behind the scenes because I, I really wanted to know the answer to the question. Somebody showed a calculated field at work earlier that was from version seven. They're like, what is this thing? I don't know when Pivot was. I can't remember. I remember being there at the conference when it was announced going, that's amazing. When did that come out? But yes. You are right, Erin. It's been in there for a very long time now, but it's hardly anyone's found it because unless you know to click multiple columns there. So it does depend on the data set. Like you can't pivot with every data set, right? So that's why if you're not seeing it, it's got to be like a text file or something like that, Google Sheets. It can't be like a C custom SQL query or something like that, right? So yep. um, yeah, that might be why you're not seeing it. Absolutely. And Jay, that's a really good point too. Some of the um, you know, tips and tricks that can work really well when you're connecting to an Excel file or, you know, something simpler, um, you know, 
doesn't always work when you've got bigger data coming in. And so um, that's where Tableau Prep, um, I'm excited for Carl's presentation, can really help us out as well. And a question from Ryan, I am in 2020.1 because that's where I have a current client at. So I know that relationship data modeling wasn't there, um, but I'm excited to learn about it and get to, uh, get to play with it. So if there are any other questions, I'll go ahead and say done for these. And otherwise, um, Carl, I'll hand it over to you. Cool. Thank awesome. you. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. First of all, I have to apologize. I'm British, so I know I sound funny anyway. But just on top of that, i am also got a bit of a cold. It's not COVID. It is a cold. Um, so, yeah, just I'm, I'm struggling a little bit for my voice. Hopefully it's OK. Hopefully you can understand me. Um, and let's share my screen and, and let's get everything underway. So I, I, I love the talk by Erin. I hadn't actually seen what she was going to present up to this point. Um, so it actually kind of tails in quite well because when when kind of Sean originally kind of threw out the idea of this, I kind of love the idea of a user group just about prep because normally if I talk at a user group or a rock up, then I talk about prep and that's it and move on. It's really kind of cool and fun to hear from other people talking about prep and thinking about it in different ways. So that makes uh, life a lot, a lot easier. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of some really cool ideas. So I'm going to take what Erin just spoke about and try and build on a little bit more because maybe you haven't seen Tableau Prep yet. So that will be part of this talk. But also I kind of know a few people are kind of kicking around and have heard of it and had a bit of a play. I want to give you some kind of some hints and tips and also kind of show you some of those hidden gems that have started to bubble up into prep recently. Um, so there's a little, little teasing workflow down at the bottom around some of the things that we might get stuck into in a little bit. So first of all, let's go and actually take a couple of steps back. Erin, I didn't know she was going to cover what she did. Um, I'm really glad she did because it means I can whiz through some of the, the kind of theory bit a little bit first. But that point on emphasis that she made around whether you're that database administrator who just kind of wonders why people can't get their hands around this or whether you're the person who's kind of stuck at the tail end of you get a dump out of SQL or something into an Excel file and told to crack on. I, I think that that empathy side um, is, is really super useful to think about on both sides. I think that largely comes down to people either not remembering what it took to learn data preparation in the first place or not knowing kind of what Tableau's answers to that are. And whenever we talk about the word Tableau, we instantly think visualization. So it's this prep piece that kind of starts to play in this space and starts to kind of give us a few options. Because I'm going to kind of take you on a little bit of a history journey, probably even further back than, than version nine of Tableau, which was kind of going back to those early days when sadly my career started. Um, that seems for me just a few years ago. Now that's actually quite a few years ago. But when I kind of started out, I, I was running a, a BI team um, for an analytic, uh, for an insurance uh, company in the UK. But my team was producing work in Excel and they were copying and pasting the charts they built in Excel into PowerPoint, would send those to the stakeholders. The stakeholders weren't happy, they'd want something changed, often if there was a red rag rating on it, for example. And then we kind of worked our way backwards from there and kind of just went through the same process again and again. So the early days of self-service visualization for me was a complete game changer to that. To have the ability to use Tableau, which I found back in version 5.2 in Tableau Public, looking for tools that could do this stuff better, the fact I could go and connect my own data set to it, or even my team could go and connect their own data set to it, and start piecing that together became super useful and just a complete game changer. And it's kind of hard to almost think back to those times where life wasn't like that before and that that's just kind of a little bit scary for us to to kind of remember those times where everything is was locked down and we didn't have the access to the things that we needed so those kind of self-service visualization days was for me really powered by tableau and i think for lots of people around me it's powered by tableau as well before that tools were quite it driven formal requests would have to go in so this chance to go and explore and analyze my own data was great. The chance to get my team to do that and for things to be relatively automated was even better. To then go and share that analysis as we were forming it and as we were finding things in the data became a lot more powerful. But Erin was right. 
as soon as you go to your first Tableau training session, you're kind of super empowered as a Tableau trainer. I love that kind of spark that happens in somebody's eyes where all of a sudden it's like, I can do this stuff myself. I don't have to, wait. oh no, you don't, this is cool. And you go back to your desk and you pick up your data set that you want to go and analyze and you realize it's not that easy. And for me, that really does come down to the self-service data prep piece, which is why when Tableau prep came out, I was a little bit too geekily excited because there are so many examples where we have multiple dates as column headers with the values held underneath and that's just not going to make use of Tableau easy. Often as Erin showed with the, with the calculated fields to go and pick out the different measures, there's ways around it. It just isn't that easy thing that we've just been taught to use. There isn't a fun thing that we used to, that we've just been taught to use. But it kind of comes back to that fact that data is everywhere around us, whether it is those spreadsheets on somebody else's machine that they want you to kind of start analyzing and start thinking about, whether it's at the end of an API, whether it's hidden away in a database that maybe don't have the coding skills to be able to go and pick apart, that data is everywhere. We need to go and analyze it to be able to answer our questions that we have about what we know of. I've worked in numerous organizations now where I'm part of that central analytics function or, or the center of excellence kind of sitting at the heart of what's being done within Tableau. Well, that's great, but I don't know those people's jobs as well as they do. My world is so much better when I turn the kind of laptop round and pass it to them rather than trying to do the work myself. So if we can get them to use their data, they're going to know where it is. They're going to know what it means. They're going to know what questions they need to ask about it way more than I can. But data's messy as well. So, so giving them that power to visualize it isn't enough if we're then kind of tying their hands and saying, whoa, whoa, whoa no, that's great. Visualize the data, fantastic. But uh, just wait a minute, because we just kind of need to prepare this data set for you. That's not fun. That's not great. That just feels, feels really limiting. And that's where we kind of come across this idea that I fundamentally believe humans are curious. You show them something, they'll want to ask something else about it go and empower people to do that and we're great. Well, currently we didn't really have a thing that worked for self-service data prep. The best we had was pivot in our desktop connection screen. That was that and split when that got announced. Like I said, I got super excited when I heard that at the conference because it was fine I was able to do more within Tableau. I didn't have to go and square away and do that within the data source first and kind of as I get sent that new Excel spreadsheet, I knew that I kind of needed to do it again. So all of a sudden, if I can kind of empower my own data prep, I can kind of go and start to just be my curious self and ask those questions a lot faster. Erin's covered beautifully what, what shape we need for Tableau because that was what stum people stumbled across. I almost spent more time training. When you go back to your desk, this is what's going to hurt. What is that shape for Tableau that we actually needed? A single row per record, completely agree with that. What is that observation? A single column for each identifiable data, identifiable data field. Completely agree with that. But there's one thing I'd, I'd add to Erin. She made a really great point about the tables. So she has one over on me. But it's that individual column needing to be a single data type. That's the piece that I'm always trying to advocate to get in. So that way you can handle your dates in the way that you want to, whether that's a date value, date part, or whether those are discrete and continuous values that you're actually working with. But how does Tableau Prep help? Well, Tableau prep was this answer to the, the kind of sticking point of, I want to be able to use my data, but I don't really know how to go about working on this stuff because it took Tableau's visual nature, Tableau's user focus, ease of use, and kind of turned that into a tool where I can go and work with my data in a way that looks and feels familiar, um, even if I've never really kind of done this stuff too much before. And also it lets you go and jump out into Tableau, into desktop, whenever you want to, whenever you kind of need to, whenever you think you might be ready, or actually I kind of need to go and explore this a bit further beyond what we see from the profile pane just down in this bottom right hand corner. The profile pane is beautiful, creating those histograms, understanding what values I have within my data set, not having to do any work to do that apart from connecting a data source is brilliant. I, I mentioned to the team earlier, I had formerly had a few hundred thousand tables uh, that I had to go and understand and access and, and piece together in a SQL environment. These are the histograms that I used to build to understand what was in that data set before carrying on. Tableau Prep's doing that for me. That's using those visual nature 
of Tableau and all of those skills to kind of get me there a lot sooner. So what actually is prep when we're talking about prep? If you are new to the tool, we actually, we're talking about two tools here. When prep was originally released, it was just the tool that we now call prep builder. Very much like Tableau desktop sits on your laptop or on your computer and is that local um, item where I'm going to go and connect data to it. And then I'm going to output something from it. Unlike desktop, what we're connecting to is data, but it can be messier, unstructured, clean, dirtier data. I want to say unclean data. But what that we're outputting is not necessarily a visualization. We can come up with answers within prep, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to the profile pane. But actually, what we're outputting is a clean data source, structured data source, ready for analysis. The product is still quite new. It was released in April 2018. So um, coming up to its two and a half year birthday, but it's aimed at those kind of repeatable, simple tasks. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sure, I'm sure you've had those times where I've got to go and connect to a data set, but I know next week, next month, next quarter, that data set, because it's a system output, it's coming straight back to me in the same way. If I'm going to do this analysis again, I'm going to have to go and do that task. If at that point you don't kind of cry a little inside, then I'm not sure if you're fully human or you're just a really glutton for punishment if you're really enjoying those kind of tasks. Um, what Prep's trying to do is take away the time it takes to do that stuff through either Builder, actually as I go and build out the logic once, I can reuse it multiple times, or Prep Conductor, the element of Prep that sits on the server that's available as part of the data management add-on from the server tool. And with Prep Conductor, it's doing that scheduling to go and let me just kind of completely step away from the process and let it happen, hopefully without me even touching it at all. So all of a sudden we have Tableau's user focus that we've had so much on visualization and analysis, and we've kind of got those same skills, but now kind of nicely pieced together in the tool that lets me get there. So a little bit about me, because I've spoken a lot about the tool so far. It is about the tool more than me, hence why I always start with that. Um, I'm a Tableau Zen master, got announced this year, which after using the tool for nearly 10 years was quite a surprise. I kind of got to the point where I didn't think I was going to be there. But it's because I've kind of been focusing on prep. And the reason I'm focusing on prep isn't because Tableau's created a cool product around it. It's because I genuinely believe it's a thing that we're not really helping our users to be able to do. And if we're rolling out self-serve capability, then it's the bit that we're not really training as much as we should do. What that led to was me writing a whole load of blog posts on the prep and data site, I'll mention that in a second, around just how to go about these different things. That's what I've now turned into a book. So through O'Reilly, Tableau Prep Up and Running, um, that was released August, so now last month, and the Kindle version and the paper version's out this month you'll kind of get the idea that I love teaching because I mention about that empowerment piece quite a lot. Um, that's actually my full-time job. So I am the other head coach at the data school in the UK, one of the leading Tableau and Ultrix training programs around the world. Um, and really what I'm trying to do is leverage my experience in data, but just go and empower people to do more. That actually led to prep and data. And so what prep and data is, is a weekly challenge, much like makeover Monday, workout Wednesday, uh, sports with Sunday, etc. But this one's focused just on the data prep part. Because what I was really clear was the guy down in the bottom left hand corner, Jonathan Allenby, as I was teaching him in the, uh, the data school one day, he came to me and said, loads of really kind of in interesting stuff within what we went through, we've just gone through Tableau prep. But is there any way to go and practice this? And I kind of shrugged my shoulder and said, no, but that absolutely should be. That coffee chat led to what we have as prep and data today. We decided to start writing our own challenges. I'd write the challenge based on my experience. Jonathan would kind of post his solution and then kind of kind of cobble together everybody else's solutions as well, whether that's Rosario, Donna Coles, Kate Brown, whoever else wanted to kind of get in contact and, and kind of kind of work along with us as we worked our way through this. It also helped us kind of form some prep best practice and, and find some of those kind of little hidden gems that we'll, we'll cover off shortly. So we started in February 2019. We've now done 80 plus challenges. <coughs> We'd love you to come and play along, whether that's working on some of those early challenges or the later challenges. There are a range of skills. They're not slowly getting harder. It's just the, the tools getting a few more things in. 
So um, come and dive in. And if you want any help, Jenny and Tom. So Jenny in the middle, Jenny Martin and Tom Prowse have been doing an amazing job on writing up the solution posts and posting videos on how to do things too. So yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to see you guys take part and please fill in the solution track if you do because it shows that you're finding the site useful and, and giving us feedback. But you're here for tips. You want to know not just what prep is, but actually uh, what can we actually do with it? And again, I wasn't prepared for Aaron's talk, ironically. Um, so I should have planned this better. But I actually thought wherever I start talking about tips, I should actually talk about how to how to prep or plan your prep. Because I think it's one thing that people get really used to with Tableau Desktop, that it's an iterative process when you go through and build a dashboard. Yeah, I might sketch out my idea of what the dashboard might look like, what elements it might have. But until you start working with the data, you don't know whether that's possible. You don't know what it's there. Well, very much like I, uh, uh, sorry, Aaron went through, thinking through that process and just kind of taking that step back first of all can really help you. Because Tableau Prep can be an iterative tool too. If I don't know how to do something, it's nice to go and iterate and try and work out how to, how to piece those bits together. What I'd be super careful of doing though is doing no planning at all and just diving into prep. So I've got a little basic four stage model to go and look at of how to go and just set up your planning. So first of all, KYD, know your data, work out what the desired state is, work out what some of those logical transitions might be between those two parts from that input to the output, and then finally go and build it. So let's dive into that in a little bit more detail. I've then got a second set of tips, which will look at some of the new features, and then I'll do a little bit of speed tipping at the end. So just bear with me again while we dig into the theory just this a little bit more. So Aaron's done a great job of thinking and talking you through what to look at when you first look at the data set. I actually sketch it out. I kind of take that moment of just stepping back, sketching out what's the column structure? What does this thing actually look like? Where are my categorical pieces of data? So what you might know as dimensions or discrete data within Tableau Desktop. But also where are my values hidden within that data set? Is, is the date an actual value? Is it a categorical piece of data? Up for you to decide. But first of all, just taking that step back and simplifying what I've got in front of me is super useful. I know all data sets aren't as simple as this little example table at the top. We're not often talking about just six columns of data. But trying to simplify the data for you just gives you that chance to A, recognize what's in front of you, but also B, what you might start wanting to do with that data set. Try not to let your brain rush ahead. Just take that step back but do start to just write in a couple of dummy values and you'll start to think what's actually there and what you might want to do to your data. Because ultimately you do want to then go and step completely away from that input and think about what do I want the desired state to be? So where do I want the output to get to? What structure do I need to, it to be? And what values do I need to have? How many decimal points? All of those kind of things. Tableau Desktop gives us a lot of flexibility there. Certainly in terms of those values and the formatting, the, the formatting that's passed between prep and desktop isn't great at the moment, that's being worked on. But to have that chance to go and really make sure the values are clean and gonna, it's gonna go and work for the solutions I need, that is a great place to be. Taking the kind of approach here, where I've left the example table down in the bottom left-hand corner, having that chance to look at the fact I've got two different Lewisham branches here, do I want to pull them into one? Yeah, I want a single town name. Drop that down as a note to myself. What is that data structure that I'm looking for? What should the values look and feel like? Again, kind of almost to Aaron's point around number of rows, how many null should I have, how many should I not? Thinking that through is super useful at this point, just to make sure I'm getting the right things. The other piece I think about here is data, data type. That each of these data columns will have a data type within both prep and desktop as you work your way through. So having that moment just to kind of just plan ahead for what you're expecting these things to be will help you further down the line as well. Step three is then how do you get between these? And I call these logical transitions. These are anything but logical uh, for when you start doing data prep because who has the experience of how to do this stuff? You might have worked a little bit in desktop. You might have worked a little bit in other tools, but just know that what I'm talking about here with logical transitions is as simple as the seven or eight steps that we actually have within prep. Inputting, cleaning, 
uh, pivoting, aggregation, union joins, et cetera, or outputting the data, we are making this as easy as possible for ourselves. So I'll go and spot those values that I might want to clean up. I'll go and talk about the reshaping that I want to do in terms of taking columns and turning into more rows or rows and turning into more columns. I will go and think about those kind of transitions that I'll need to make. If you're new to the tool and you don't know how to make those, or if you're new to prep, but you're not new to data preparation, then actually that's a really nice way to just kind of, just make sure that you're working through what do I need to do first? And what are the kind of things I need to change? Because that's almost your to-do list to then go and work against for the rest of your time working on the, the data preparation flow. You might not know how to do it, but you've just made it a heck of a lot easier to go and Google and find those answers for how do I go and do something or um, check out some of the posts on prep and data of how do I go and do a pivot? What choices do I have to make? I know I need to pivot, I just don't know how. Cool, you just made that a lot easier for yourself, especially when you know how and when you might need to do that. And then it's a case of just building. And I think it's, this is the time to get hands on with the tool. You might not be right first time. You might not have planned this thing perfectly. That's fine, step back. Go and build out that flow. If you get stuck, the forums are always there for help. Uh, there's numerous kind of blog articles out there, videos from other people showing those different techniques. It's almost like when I learned SQL code, I'm a history and politics student. So yeah, I would fight over social sciences and humanities, um, but I'm, I'm very much from, not from a computing background. So when I learned SQL, I spent my life Googling. When you start to learn those terms of what to Google, life becomes a lot easier. Use some of PrEP's own terminology to, and just learn a little bit of that, and it will make finding a way to break down those challenges that much easier. <coughs> Excuse me. So ultimately, the last point here, let the data flow. I completely believe in that. Oh, my throat is completely dying as well. Let's see how long I can last. So second set of tips, stay up to date. This is completely flipping everything on its head. If you've used prep for a little while, maybe you've seen new features come out and you just, like me, felt really challenged on staying up to date with everything that's going on. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to do prep and data with Jonathan. It is a rapidly developing product. Tableau desktop, server, all of the other products, at least on a quarterly basis. We're used to talking about 2020.3 for the third quarter in 2020. Well, PrEP has 2020.3.1. They are the different releases within the quarter. PrEP is releasing still on a monthly cadence, which means sometimes these really useful features can actually sneak past us without us actually even seeing them. So having that chance just to kind of try and stay up to date with what's going on within the tools and just having a bit of a play can be super useful. Three things that have kind of come out that I think I want to highlight how they work within PrEP, because if you have used PrEP for a while, you may have seen them or you may not. It becomes a little bit of a challenge if uh, you don't know where to look for a couple of these. And then the final piece, custom data roles, was something that was released, I think largely slipped under people's radars. So I just wanted to go into that in a little bit of detail. So incremental refresh. Incremental refresh allows us to not have to rerun the full flow uh, against all of the data set if we're updating something. So if we just have new rows and records in our data set that's only getting added, let's say each day or each week, but the rest of my data set's pretty big, it's kind of quite a lot of waste of time and computing power to rerun that every time. That's why we have the option for incremental refresh. It arrived last quarter in 2020.2.1, and you'll actually find the functionality in both the input and the output. And I remember when kind of seeing this within the beta product and just trying to work my head around this. And it just kind of took me a moment before going, okay, that's actually pretty clever. Because the way that you set up the incremental refresh is actually in the input step. The input step allows us to go and connect to our data sets and kind of just is there. But actually hidden within the settings tab of your input step is this little tick box. Do I want to enable incremental refresh? As soon as I tick yes on that, that actually changes quite a lot of my output options. But the first thing that I need to do is go and specify, well, what is the thing that I'm gonna go and judge that increment by? In this case, I have a field called month. And I'm saying that as I get new values in that month column, then I'm gonna be able to go and pick it up from there. You're only able to use certain fields um, or field data types. 
uh, within your incremental refresh. So it needs to be something that kind of has some logic behind it as to where those new values are and a number is bigger than another or a date is later than the previous date. So Tableau Prep can actually understand what's new data coming in. But also we can go and say within our flow, if we've built our output yet, what output we're actually changing because we might only want to change one of our output types as well as what field we're, we're affecting as we get through further through. Because sometimes we'll start changing names of columns and we might lose track. So being able to capture that all within the input is actually quite useful or going back and updating it afterwards. In the output step, we'll find when we enable in incremental refresh, we get this incremental refresh option that pops up as well. And let's just go and choose how we want to deal. Do we want to do a full incremental refresh? Do we just want to append to the existing table? So the full incremental refresh where you're just actually wiping out everything else and only leaving the increment there. And those options actually start appearing for whichever options you choose within your full and incremental refresh. Those options come in as your output. So within your output, you'll see that you've got an additional little drop down arrow or a carrot as it's known at the end of the output step that lets you go and tweak those changes. You're putting a lot more hands in or power in people's hands as you're going through this. So you want to go and just use these, these steps with care, especially when we start thinking about our, our next update right to DB. We don't want somebody to accidentally run a workflow and overwrite a whole history table with just the latest last two rows that have been added. So, so this is kind of becoming part of the challenge with data prep, that people want you to be more cautious, but they're not necessarily giving you the place to, or the space to play. Again, that's what we're trying to do with prep and data to try and create that. Write to DB, write to database. I don't know how many of you SQL code, but for me back in the day before I learned SQL coding, if somebody came up with this, I would actually fly to Seattle and give them a hug directly. It arrived in, in the latest version, so 2020.3, and is found just in the output step. It allows us to use prep to not just write to files and publish data sources, by that we mean Tableau Server, but also write back to the database table where we found something. If we've taken messy data, to the chance to go and overwrite that data set with nice, clean, fresh data, rather than leaving it for somebody else to do their own cleanup next time, is a big change. There's seven different output connections at the moment where we can go and connect it to those databases <coughs> to write back to. But a really interesting one is PostgreSQL. So PostgreSQL is the database that sits behind the server. Having the ability to write some tables with some of that cleaned up data, I know is, is definitely gonna be useful for a lot of people. Um, I spent my life in Teradata, lots more people on Snowflake. There's just gonna be so much more benefits digging through this over time. So if you haven't explored right to DB yet, um, you might also be sneakily surprised with how easy this is to use. When I first used an early version of uh, right to DB, my jaw was kind of on, on the table with just how simple it was. Um, so go off and try it. It's pretty, it's pretty flexible. And yeah, the team would love to hear your feedback on it a bit more. My final piece is custom data roles in, in terms of kind of those hidden gems within the tool. It arrived quite a while ago, so 2019.3.1. And it's actually found within the clean step, but it does involve conductor. What a data role is, uh, is often we can assign things like date, uh, sorry, um, state or country or some, or um, whether something's a valid email, et cetera. So does it fit the right format for an email address? And we can go and specify that and select within our data type, not just that something's a string, but give it a specific data role. <coughs> within the profile pane of the clean step. Well, that's great, but we have business rules in pretty much every organization that I've ever come across that would love to go and apply their own logic of, here's all the values that should be valid in that column. That's where the custom data role steps in. So you can actually go and take a column of data, publish it to your server using Prep Conductor, and it then stays on there and is available as a custom data role that you can then go and pick up. So in this case, I've just created uh, liquid soap and bar soap um, as my um, products. So therefore antibacterial soap, when I go and actually apply this data role as, as product, then flashes up that it's actually antibacterial soap isn't one of our product types. And therefore we've got something to sort out within our data set. So that's a lot of theory around ideas of um, how to go about your prep, 
some of the great hidden gems within Tableau Prep. But I wanted to kind of share some of my little kind of tweaks and, and things that I found super useful in the tool. So I'm just going to take two minutes just to jump through. Maybe I can squeeze in 10 if I'm super quick. So I have a prep workflow where I have some of these things enabled already. Let's go and name and flick through some of these and I'll just hide my comments, which is where I've actually saved all of those useful tips. And my first one is actually the flow pane. So lots of times people kind of just have to mess around with the flows quite a lot. If I don't know how long this flow goes on for, because it's already going off my screen, uh, since about 2019, we can go down to our 100%, so our actual reset size view. And I do have the chance to go and actually fit this flow to the whole screen. So I can actually see I was only missing one additional step. Perhaps zoomed out to 91%, and it just lets me go and dive back in. So if you don't know where you've dropped something, if it's gone in a little bit too close, go down and hover. You've got the little four kind of corner arrows, fit flow to the window, click on that, and it'll zoom out to the full screen. I find that super useful. Another thing which is really useful is if you click on the little up arrow, the flow navigator, it shows you what part of the flow is being shown on your screen. You can actually go and navigate around that really quickly. Again, little things that kind of help you just navigate and use Tableau Prep really quickly. This is actually week six, uh, Prep and Data 2019, and I've just built out the flow already, but I've got some sneakily little useful functions within here. So if I just go and click on my first one, the calc over the right, I really like this as a little tweak, but quite often when you go and create a new calculated field in prep, if you give that field a new name, it'll actually go and create a different data field. Well, that's actually not the case when you actually use the same name. So you'll notice here I've got a calculation called type of soap and it uses a field called type of soap. Well, I haven't had to actually go and delete out a data field at all, it's actually just lurking here. Because I've used the same data field name exactly, it just actually overwrites. That's a real nice little time saver and it saves you clogging up your changes pane <coughs> with, with too much stuff because you're actually just able to overwrite that data set nice and simply. The one uh, next tip that completely confounded me and confuffled me, first of all, when I used Tableau Prep and went into those calculated fields was the sum function just isn't that. It actually is now lurking there a little bit because you can find it due to level of detail calcs. But actually, originally it wasn't there. And it's because when we're actually doing a sum, we're using the aggregate step. And the aggregate step is changing that granularity of our data. Because that's ultimately what we're doing in sum within desktop. But we're setting that what's something being aggregated by, i.e. our grouped by fields, based on what discrete fields we have within our view. So what are those blue data fields that we have in our view? That's almost what your group by is being. And then off the back of that, you're able to go and aggregate your values. You can go and drop your discrete values in if you want to have them aggregated by just clicking on group and selecting count or count distinct, min max, et cetera. So there are ways to use data flexibly. But if you think about your blue fields in Tableau and your green fields in Tableau, that can often help you get your data set to be the way that you want to do it, first and foremost. We saw joins in Erin's talk that were really nicely done and easily pieced together. But I often find myself adding a clean step after a join. Tableau's join uh, is really kind of clean, nice and easy to see and seeing what's actually going on within the actual flow. But what I often find myself doing is just going and taking, certainly on an inner join, whatever I've just connected to <coughs> or set up my join condition as and going and deleting one of those values when it's an inner join. Because otherwise, yeah, you're just going to get duplicated data sets. So for me, quick out of a clean step, get rid of some of those data sets or data fields that are duplicated. It's much easier than doing it in the join tool, which I've seen kind of create a few errors sometimes. Now, you might be wondering why I've got a union step in the middle of my flow when I don't have any additional data sets flowing into it. And that's because whenever you add a union step, you actually get this table of names, which is super useful when you have things what I might need for the rest of my analysis. In this case, the fact that these are my sales from England. I need to pick that up and use that within my flow. Without a union step, you'll notice that I don't have that within my data set. The union step always adds your table names in. You can then go and use string calculations to go and parse out the word England with just a little bit of string magic 
I do love a, a mid or a, a find function within Tableau. So that becomes a pretty quick and easy way to go and piece uh, together calculations that use those table names that you would be able to lose otherwise on, you might have to manually enter. While I'm here, let me talk about these light bulbs, because Tableau will actually make recommendations as to what to do with your data the, as you start loading data and working with it, you'll find these little light bulb signs at the top of your clean pane or in the clean step at the top of your profile pane. So that's just going to go and make uh, judgments around what you might want to do. Maybe I want to set up a data role here in this case, take England, make it my state or province. That's all possible. It's not something you have to do. It just starts to become useful. Up here, we've got exactly the same being mentioned because it's just trying to say, well, actually go and use that geographic data role and actually go and set that up to as a state or province. Um, Tableau classes England, Scotland as states, I still class them as countries, hence the data field name. My final tip where I will leave you with is last but not uh, least, the actual data grid. I think a lot of people struggle with knowing when is enough enough within prep. So building out that flow, what do you need to do with it? Well, the data kind of looks and feels right from my profile pane. You actually have the chance just to go and get rid of that profile pane and just select just the data grid, or if you want to, the metadata grid, which I find actually a little bit harder to use personally, but just flipping back to that data grid. Those three buttons are really a little bit too hidden, um, but are super useful for when you do want to use that profile or when you do want to use the data grid. I think that was about eight tips, but I'm conscious of time that I feel like I'm, I'm pushing things a little bit too far. So at that point, I'm gonna stop sharing and kind of end the tips there. I have managed to sneak a talk into the, the Tableau conference that's coming up, well, TC20-ish, I believe is the official term now. Um, so I'll come up with some more tips there if you want to come back for any more. But yeah, hopefully that gives you a flavor of prep, but also some of the neat things that you can do with it. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl, for that. That was awesome. Uh, a couple of questions from the Q&A. Uh, just talked about um, how write to DB can be um, really useful for data federation and coming up with federated data sets. Um, and how if you have any experience of people using prep conductor and prep builder to build these federated data, data sources. Um, not a huge amount because it's only just come out. I, I'm really intrigued to see how much this does get used. Um, and I think it's going to be a slow burn for two reasons. One, people getting used to the tool. But the second one, IT teams kind of relaxing their, their kind of standards to, to let normal people like me, hello, um, go and start writing these things. So uh, I'm massively advocating people start using the tool and start using... Um, and, and getting IT teams to support them with a little sandbox environment so they can start writing them to see what those tables are useful. Very much like we do with a desktop once we build a data set, can we actually go and send to check whether that's uh, useful? And do we know, are we doing the right things ultimately? So yeah, that's where I yeah. tweaked that a little bit. Nice, yeah. I, uh, I, really, I really enjoyed your presentation. I've, I've really enjoyed playing with Tableau Prep. And one thing that I would just, um, for users, it, you know, it, we fluctuated about a, with about a hundred people, um, and I know that uh, pricing has been a uh, an issue. But anybody who has a creator license has the ability to download Tableau Prep Builder. Uh, one thing that I've used it for, we don't have it in our prod environment, but one thing I've used it for is to, I kind of draw the analogy between what Tableau Desktop has done for visualizing a table. Prep Builder helps me to understand visually what SQL is doing. Um, like it's really kind of a, a neat way to learn SQL. <clears throat> Additionally, going back to what Aaron talked about earlier, if I can build something in prep in the structure that I want it, I can then take an export, a CSV export to my DBA and be like, I need this table structured like this, please. Um, if I don't have the ability to write my SQL. So, um, it's just a, an interesting, don't think that if your company isn't using prep conductor that you shouldn't be at least exploring the product. So um, that's, that would be my, my one word of advice. <clears throat> and and I'd, I'd kind of go on to that and, and talk about the documentation as well. You've, you've seen the little notes that I've been adding as I've gone through. 
you've perhaps only got seven or eight steps. It's really quick to walk somebody through a workflow of here's how I got to that CSV output. Because I, I think in, in so many times, and I've been on the other end of it, a request has been thrown over the fence. And as, as the data person, you've just got to respond to it. How, how the heck did they come up with that? Whereas if you've got that logic in front of you and it doesn't take much to kind of piece that together, then I think that can actually really help. So it's helping everybody communicate about what those requirements are, which is kind of neat. Exactly. Yeah. So one thing on PREF that we just found out is that if your company is on the old perpetual licensing model, you don't have access to PREP because you don't have a creator license, you have a professional license. Um, so if you're, so if you run into that issue, that might be the reason why you should reach out to your, your Tableau admin and, you know, see what, if that's the case. And then, you know, if you really need to use it and make a business case for it, you can still purchase it one off. Right. But it's just not included. I, if you're not old. I don't know if you can. Well, you can purchase, the a, create, purchase I, the creator license, right? Oh, purchase the creator, purchase yes. Sorry, creator. I was going to say, I don't think you can purchase yeah. directly and you to get drive much people to subscription. I never said that. That didn't get recorded. Damn, it did. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, um, the, the, the pricing and the usage of this, I think as we get more use cases in the community, then mm -hmm. again, why I love the fact that you guys are running a, a prep-based user group. As we get those use cases, we find more value from each other and, and learn from each other that will drive that in and hopefully we'll soon be looking back and going, did we ever even second guess the value behind the data prep piece in the same way that we do with desktop now? Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carl. I really appreciate, uh, I know it's late over there for you. So uh, appreciate it. Um, appreciate you taking the time for us. Cool. Thank you for having me, everybody. You bet. Carl. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to, uh, Pivot now to uh, Lucas, and uh, he's going to show you uh, a really cool uh, use case for. Uh... Can you guys hear me? Okay, I lost Sean's audio kind of at the very end here. So, Jay, Aaron, yeah, anybody? Sure. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Awesome. That was scary for just a second. Let me share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. So um, we usually say the best comes last, right? Well, I can guarantee that's nothing. Nothing could be further from the truth today. So hopefully I can get something valuable for you guys today out of this, but it's going to be hard to knock those, those presentations from Carl and Aaron today. So um, Carl has already prefaced a lot about Tableau. Um, Prep conductor. My presentation today is is focused around um, how do we use um, prep from a scheduling and automation perspective when we don't have um, conductor available, and that's what I'm what I'm planning to show. Um, my demo today is going to be on version 2019.3, so um, some of the functionality that was just covered, like writing to um, outputting to databases, is unfortunately something I can't cover um, with this demo, but we'll. We'll, we'll try to show something interesting here. So before we, we get started, um, just a quick overview here about me. I'm name is Lucas. Um, I'm a senior BI developer today at Ericsson. My LinkedIn contact information there or email. Not a big Twitter guy when it comes to Tableau or Vizis, um, like most of the community is. So those are kind of my, my two go-tos. Not written a book or done anything super fancy yet besides just using Tableau for the past, what, seven, eight years, um, both on the Tableau desktop side, um, building dashboards, and also as a uh, Tableau admin running a server and a center of excellence. So that's that's me in a quick nutshell. So um, as, as described today, uh, prep is a, is a two, um, there's, there's two pieces to prep, just the builder side and then conductor. Um, conductor is a part of the that data management add-on package, which usually comes with a separate licensing model. And a lot of people don't have that today, or they're just using versions prior to when conductor was available. And while um, prep is really cool, one obstacle that people sometimes face is how do I build my, my, my flow and then have it on the schedule so that I don't need to constantly have to open prep and refresh it every time I need I need fresh data. So that's that sometimes becomes a barrier um, 
of entry for, for usage and, and adoption. But what a lot of people don't realize is that um, prep also comes with its, its command line, its it, um, utility, which, which allows you to do some, some degree of automation similar to what you could do with tab command or um, tab admin on the old server days. And that's what we'll, we'll cover today here uh, in just a bit. So what's our path here to automation for this example? This by no means is proprietary. I didn't invent or create any of this. There's a lot of information out on the web covering the same scenario, but I just tried to aggregate and summarize it here for you guys in this short presentation. So the first thing we need, obviously, is a prep flow. I am not going to embarrass myself um, using prep after what we just saw from Carl, so I'll just use a, a flow that, that's ready to, to go. Um, we'll need that as our step one. Um, as step two, we need a JSON file, and I know not everybody comes from the same background here, then I don't wanna get too technical um, into things, so don't get scared if these terms are, are not, not um, something that you're familiar with. They're not as scary as they might sound. So we'll need that credentials file just to authenticate against the flow that we created. And then we'll tie those two together, running them via command line. As far as automation, a few things you can do. You can put them on a schedule. You can do event logging to see, to keep track when things ran, whether they failed or not. You can set email notifications, for example. I'm not going to go too much in depth on um, points 4.2 and 4.3 because those go into a little bit more of the scripting side and, and maybe not everybody here may be interested. If you do want to, to see more about that or want me to send you the script I used, um, just let me know and I can share that after the meeting as well. So um, moving on to, to step one and two in the same slide. First thing we need to do here is just map our inputs and outputs on that existing, existing flow. So I have, I have a sample one here on the screen with three different inputs and an output. And depending on the type of input or output that you have, they need to be configured differently. So this is nothing different than when you open Tableau Desktop or Prep and you connect to your data source. The only difference is that in those tools, you get a friendly pop-up on the screen with empty boxes that are intuitive for you to enter your credentials. But what you're doing here in creating that the JSON file that I spoke about is just you're using those same parameters and putting them into a text file that will save it as a JSON format. That's going to look like what I'm showing here on the right-hand side. So going through this exercise and looking at my flow, my first step, I have Superstore data that right now is housed in Tableau server. And then if I look at my cheat sheet here um, in the bottom, I can see how, um, <clears throat> how you know, what, what parameters I need to put into my file. So this being a Tableau server, I can simply copy and paste that in here, respecting the array definitions for the input connections, and then replace those parameters with what's specific to my case. Everything here is mocked up besides my password at 456. I just like to keep them simple um, like that and not forget. So going into step two, which is my regional data, that comes from a SQL Server database. So now I copy this other portion and add it right here to my file. And I would do this exercise for as many inputs as I have. Now the third step, which is my regional goals data set here, this one actually comes from Excel. And as the definition here says, you don't really need to enter anything for Excel because that's a local file. It doesn't require any authentication. So if you um, check the right hand side on my file, there's no, no reference to anything related to that Excel. The reason why I put an asterisk on my roadmap to automation on the previous slide for this JSON file is that you only need it in case you need to authenticate one of your connections. Let's say this flow was different and your source was an Excel file and you were outputting to a hyper file, for example, on your local machine, you don't even need to create this, this JSON document at this point. So we're done with the input connections. Last thing now is just my output, which again is also, it's not described here. I, I missed on adding a definition or sorry, a description, but it also comes out of Tableau or it's going into Tableau. So I can just copy and paste that same instruction and put it down here on my file. So once we're done with this, we just save this file with a .json um, 
uh, at the end instead of .txt, and we are done with our step two. And I'll do a, a live demo after this so that you guys can see it in action. So moving on to the third step. So now, as a quick recap, we have a flow that was created. Um, I didn't really get super creative on naming conventions. I just called it demo.tfl. And there's the file path on where it's at in my, on my machine right now. And on the right, we have that JSON file, which is the instruction, the, the credentials file for um, executing this flow or for connecting to this flow. So what we need to do now is we need to take these two pieces into the command line and then tell Tableau Prep to refresh our flow without us physically opening um, Prep Builder. To do that, we just follow a simple command it starts with tableau-prep-cli.bat. Um, this is just a batch file that comes with the, with the installation of the product. Again, that's where if you use tab command before, um, this is going to be very similar on how you structure these things. Um, in addition to that, we're gonna do dash C and then copy the file path for our flow. That's, we're now again indicating that this flow requires authentication um, for you to be able to connect to the sources that you have in them. And then the last step is we need to tell where the flow is on our machine. So very simple instructions. You just use Tableau's executable file, which is tableau-prep-cli. We need to put that dash C flag saying there's a JSON that's needed and tell where it is. Then do another dash T, which it's, it's for the, the flow and then pass out that um, the location where that the flow is as well. Going back to the scenario where a JSON file wouldn't be needed, we could simply write the same statement, just leaving the dot dash C and then that location out of things. Just do Tableau Prep CLI dash T and the flow. And then there's a full reference guide um, out on the web on how you run things from the command line, the different um, arguments that you can pass into this. There's debug modes, there's incremental modes like Carl was, was talking about on his presentation, but that's not available with the version that I'm, that I'm covering here today. So with that said, let's, let's try this out. So the end goal, I have this little Tableau sheet here that just shows my sales per region and some, some targets associated to those. Right now, I don't have anything for the West built that way on purpose because I want to be able to modify this Excel file at a later point once we have our automation running and the automation pick these changes, publish it to Tableau server, and we can just refresh and get that in here. So quick recap, we need to build our JSON file. I'm using Notepad for this. Um, everything I'm using for this demo is going to be just basic tools that you probably most likely have on your machine. You can do this in many other different ways in Visual Studio and different languages, but I'm just trying to simplify the process here for everybody. So this is the exact same thing I had on that slide at this point. We're just going to save this as I'll change my, bring this onto the screen. I'll change this to all files. Call this demo2.json. That's an important piece so that we change the, the file type. Once we have that saved, the next step is we need to go to the command line. If you've never used the command line before, just um, go to your search bar, type in command, and you'll get a black screen like this. Now, if it's your first time, it might look scary, but this is the same thing, um, just in a programmatic way, for you to, for you to um, run some operations on your machine, such as navigating to different folders or telling for a specific program to run. Um, in my case here, what we want to do at this point is just run that last statement. Sorry, I have a lot on the screen and I'm probably getting a lot of people confused, but for the sake of time, I'm just trying to reuse a lot of this. So all we need to put in here on our command line is that instruction that we covered on slide three, which was calling Tableau's execution telling where our JSON file is and where our flow is as well. Now we can't do this from any folder in the system. Right now, when I log into the command line, this is saying I'm in this exact folder path here, C, users, and then my ID. 
by default, this executable that belongs to Tableau Prep Builder is only found in this location right here. So if we were to try to run it right now where I'm at, we're going to get an error saying that it cannot find this, this batch file that, that um, Tableau provides. One workaround to that is you can just add this to your path variable in your, on your environment variables, because then you will, you're allowed to run this command from anywhere. But basically, um, to make things simple, let's go in here. We need to change the directory where we're in and go into oh, C, Program Files, Tableau, Tableau Prep Builder, and then Scripts. That's where we'll find this executable. Instead of it doing it this way, just navigating through here, We'll do it through the command line, and we can do that by just copying this statement and pasting it here and hitting enter. So now I am in a brand new location, which is where that executable lives. So next step, I can just copy my instruction, paste it in here, and it started to run on its own. So this is going to go through. It's already trying to validate the, my flow and refresh it. I'm going to move it out of the screen for the sake of time and bring in what it looks like when it completes. So what you would get is an output similar to this, depending on the complexity of your flow. You can see mine took a little bit long to run. That's why I keep getting the flow execution status running over and over. But what you're really looking for is at the very end, this successful message here saying, finish running the flow and life is good. At this point, you know that your automation or at least your instruction to run this flow is ready, which is a good thing. So we, we refresh the flow without actually having to open Prep Builder. However, if we go back to the initial premise of, of this talk was how do we schedule this? I understand that I didn't have to open Prep in order to run the flow, but if I still need to go to the command line, copy these lines and then hit enter, I'm not really gaining much from it. So to do that, we'll go into the first step of automation, which is just scheduling this task. In order to do this, we need to save these two instructions that we have as part of a batch file as well, or, in a or on a different way um, that you're comfortable in doing. To make matters simple again, I'm just going to save these two lines as again. And instead of doing .txt, I'm just gonna do .bat, I already have one here, so I won't overwrite it. And now you'll have this executable on your screen as well, which if I just go in there and I open that folder, let me find it. All I need to do is double click that and it's going to run again for me without having to, to click on or go through the command line and copy and paste it there. Now, again, still not fully automated, right? Because I still need to double click these, this file. So my next step, let me start clearing out my view here, close this out, clean things up, and I'll move my Excel out of here for now. And just so you know that that did indeed work successfully, my last refresh of this flow was at 2.46 p.m. If I refresh this thing again, now I show 3.41. So we already know that data is changing behind the scenes, even though we're not using Prep Builder. So we know, how to create the JSON file, um, how to connect or link it to, to, the, to the flow, how to run it from the command line, and how to create a batch file to run that instruction. The last step would be just scheduling it now. Again, for this, ex for this exercise, for simplicity, I'm going to use Test Scheduler, which everybody has if you're on a Windows um, operating system, and here, I'm not gonna go over all of the little details that you can do in configuration settings, but just to get us um, through the finish line, you would go and click on create task. Here you can give it any name that you want. So I'm gonna say run, run my flow. We'll jump onto the triggers tab, which just, we, that's where we define when um, we want our script to, to run. So I'm gonna say I want it to run daily and then repeat every maybe 30 minutes indefinitely. Or you could change this just for a day, for 12 hours, or whatever your scenario might be. And I'll hit OK. 
So now we have an instruction, but we haven't told what should be done every 30 minutes indefinitely yet. So we'll jump onto the Actions tab. And in here, we'll click New. We want it to start a program, which all it means is just double clicking that file that we just created. And then we'll look for that file, which is my, it's called my automate run batch file. Put this in here, hit OK, hit OK again. Now we have a new task on the system called run my flow. And it's going to run at 340, at last run at 342. And the next runtime is going to be at 412 um, central time today. Now, at this point, there's nothing else we need to do. But the only drawback with this method is this relies on the user being logged on or, or using the machine. Your, your computer needs to be on. So if this is something that you plan on making it as, as a production solution, for example, your best bet is to take the same approach and put it on a server. And if you don't have control of that, just talk to your server admin and, and they can um, place these files there. You just provide the flow and the JSON um, in the JSON file and they'll schedule it for you because the server machine will never stop. Um, in your case, if you do decide to shut down and, and um, turn off your computer, then this may, may miss some runs. So we have this, this scheduled to run. As I mentioned, just so we can show that the automation is indeed working, we were missing the target here for the West. I'm gonna go back into my file, add one in here. Let's say five million, I missed a zero. Save this Excel file and minimize it. And because I did it at the, every 30 minutes, I'm not gonna keep you guys, of course, in this demo for the next 30 minutes, so I'll just force a run right now. I right-clicked on that and said run. It's going to attempt running it here again. And as soon as it's done, we should be able to refresh and be able to see the data on the dashboard. So the loop that we're going here is we're connecting as an input to Tableau Server, joining with the database and an Excel file, and then writing back to the Tableau Server, which we then use that as our connection to our new dashboard in here. While that runs um, behind the scenes here, it's gonna show some credentials that are not mocked up, so I, I put it to the side. One thing that I also wanted to cover is just event logging. So this is the script that I was talking about that I, that I wrote. So one big of advan one, one advantage when you're using extracts on the server, when you're scheduling extracts, not, nothing related to Tableau Prep, is that you're able to pick your schedules. You can check for um, when things ran and whether they completed successfully. And you will also get a notification, of course, if something goes wrong. With the approach that we're doing here, there's no such thing, right? We're just scheduling and we don't, you know, unless we go into the log files manually and we look for things, we can't confirm whether, whether it was successful or not. So um, I created just a separate environment here, a separate folder that keeps track of all of my runs. And then you can track things here, like this is a, a successful completion. Back, it was today, September 1st, 2020, at then 19 a.m. Then it ran again at 11, then at 12, then at 1, then at 2, and et cetera, without me having to, to do anything. I'm also saving error logs just in case you need to come back and revisit these. You can click on them and then go through the message and see what, what happened so that you can address for future runs. So my flow completed in the back end. I am going to refresh this again here and I expect to have a target for the West. And now I do. So automation now in place. We're not opening Prep Builder. This all goes away if you do have Conductor. But for those that don't today and think that this might be a barrier of, of entry or, or adoption, you do have a way around. Um, last thing I wanted to cover for this is these file definitions, they are very sensitive um, and specific on, on how things have to be done. Even a, a comma or, or missing a semicolon or anything like that that you, that you provide incorrectly will, um, will cause your flow to break. So on the other screen here, I am just removing this S, the letter S from output connections to call it output connection. And now I'm going to run my flow again that way, just to show the difference that that little 
you know, the, the, the syntax will make in breaking your process here from an automation standpoint. It is running behind the scenes. And I just got an email after I ran at 3.47 Central just a minute ago saying my prep flow failed. And here's my log file that I can just open and go about it um, <clears throat> to see what happened. So again, this, these are just some, some examples of automation that you can follow, um, scheduling, setting notifications, and then getting access to your logs. There's a lot more that you can do, depends on how creative and what your use case might be. But just don't, my, my end goal here, or my message towards this is, don't feel discouraged in using prep just because you don't have um, conductor available today uh, to you. So that's about it. I know I went through a lot in quite quickly, but if you guys have any questions, feel free to shout them at me. So. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for that, Lucas. That was great. Um, so uh, a couple questions that we had come in through the Q&A, uh, talking about putting passwords in the uh, JSON file and talking about possible security risks for that. And then uh, if there are any restrictions with anything that you showed, if you are not the administrator on your computer. So the, the JSON situation, um, that's, I'm, that's a tricky one because I am definitely not an expert in, in that area from a, you know, what, what can be covered and, and, and exposure. Mm -hmm. You would probably have to, to work internally, making sure that, um, that that's allowed. There's probably some other ways that you can encrypt your, your credentials and, and pass it in a different way. But that's that that goes above, um, you know, kind of my scripting capabilities here for this this exercise. Unfortunately, um, as yeah. far as as admin rights, I believe that is a requirement um, in order to to run this. So if this is something that you're not allowed admin rights, unfortunately, that that creates a a barrier possibly. Um, but if you take it to a, a server, for example, you know, whoever runs it should be able to to get that passed um, for you. Cool. And then where do you find the scheduler again? So the one I used, John, was just Windows Task Scheduler. If you go onto your search um, bar on, on Windows and just type in task, should be your first result popping up on the screen, Task Scheduler. That's just one option. There's dozens of, of third-party options that you can download and use, or depending on, like if you're using Python, for example, for this exercise, you could um, use some Python native scheduling tools as well. So don't think that's the only option you have. Cool. All right. And for Purush, yes, I can send you the link, the, the script here once we're done. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lucas. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, computer savvy person but that was uh that was pretty cool so nicely done thank you uh okay let's jump back let's finish things off here we've got a couple of announcements hopefully not a lot of you have left because we've got one very cool thing coming uh so don't drop off just yet uh okay so a couple last things before we uh jump in before we jump off here I did want to let everybody know that um, there is a virtual prep tug similar to this, uh, only it's all about Tableau prep. So if you're interested in this, want to learn more, uh, definitely want to check out the virtual prep tug. Uh, they've got one coming up uh, in a couple of weeks on the 15th of September. Uh, so you can uh, definitely check that out. I think uh, Carl's actually going to be talking again at that one, but uh, so that should different, be good. Different presentation you'll all be about to hear. <laughs> there you go. Different presentation. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Uh, that should be fun. Other thing, uh, definitely if you're interested in, if, if you've got the time, uh, definitely check out the, uh, the Tableau events calendar. Uh, this is because we've all gone virtual. You now have the ability to go and join any tug that you want. Uh, and just kind of lurk in the background. Uh, but there's some really excellent content 
that's 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 out there. So definitely check that out. They've got lots of different user groups regionally and uh, by industry. Uh, definitely check those out as well. All right. So here we go. So Carl has graciously um, given us the opportunity to give away five books uh, of his new book, Tableau Prep Up and Running. So uh, originally I asked uh, in the invite for you guys to send us uh, your Tableau data prep uh, structures, tips and tricks. Um, I didn't get that many, that's okay, not a big deal. Um, but one of those, uh, Ryan Kalavik uh, did, and so he's gonna be one of those. Um, <clears throat> others, so then I just, from there, I just randomly picked uh, four other names from people who registered. Uh, so Kevin Watson from Erickson, Susan Fleming from Farmers Insurance, Akila Belitti from Daily's Premium Meats, and Jess Duffy from Sprint and T-Mobile. So if your name is on this list, I will be reaching out to you uh, very soon to get all of the details uh, to get you either a hard copy book uh, or a Kindle version of the book. Um, and we'll, I'll work with Carl uh, and O'Reilly to, uh, to get you those. So uh, congratulations. Uh, and thank you, thank you again, Carl, for that. That's, that's really cool. So I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you everyone for dialing in. Thank you guys for having me today. Yeah. All right. So uh, again, last thing, this is your tug, Kansas City. Uh, we, the three, the four of us, uh, Lucas, Jay, Aaron, and me, we meet every month to talk about, come up with new ideas. Uh, and at one of those meetings is where we came up with the idea for this one. So if there's any, if you have any topic ideas or themes that you want to see us cover, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and we want to, we want to present content that you want to hear about uh, and learn about. And with us going virtually, uh, we have the ability to get uh, really awesome presenters. Um, so so uh, please do that. Uh, if you want to show off something cool that you do, uh, kind of like what Lucas did with scheduling your prep flows, or you came up with a really cool methodology for creating dashboards or whatever it is, if you want to show that off, absolutely, we want to hear from you. Uh, like I said, the committee meets monthly to create uh, content for the next um, for the next meetups. So we're always scheduling something new. So tell us what you want. All right. Lastly, normally I every I always end everything with go forth and viz, but that's really not going to uh, work for this one. So instead, go forth and prep. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, We'll see you next month.